All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you all can see me okay. My view is just a little bit funny, but my name is Allison and I am an educator at the St. Louis Sioux. Now, like many of you, I have been learning and working from home during this time. I know it may not look like I'm at home right now, but I am in fact standing in front of a green screen in my basement so that I can show you this picture. Uh, and this is a picture of the Mississippi River that I took about six years ago from the top of the St. Louis Arch. And that might give us a clue as to how we're going to answer our big question today. Where does the water go? So in today's webinar, we will explore where it goes, how it gets there, and maybe what are the things that it takes with it and how that can affect us and animals along the way. So a few things before we get started. If you have not found the chat box already, please go ahead and open that up so that we can interact with one another. Um, while you're in there, make sure you have it set to respond to all panelists and attendees so that I can see what you're typing. And I want to know where you're zooming in from today as well. So if you could just write in there where you're located and maybe how many people you have watching this webinar with you today. Uh, we're really excited to be able to bring these into your home. So knowing who's out there is really cool and very interesting for us kind of Zoom nerds here. <laughs> Another thing before we get started is if you have any questions about today's topic, go ahead and find the Q&A function. Um, any question you type in the chat box, there's a good chance it will get lost and myself and my helpers that are working behind the scenes might miss it. So if you submit it to the chat, that is a surefire way to make sure that I can see it and get to as many of those questions as I can at the end of today's webinar. Okay, I think that is all of the official things out of the way. You may see Connor popping in on the chat box every once in a while to um, ask you some questions and give you some reminders as well. All right, so let's get started with our topic at hand. Where does the water go? Now, I know here in St. Louis, uh, we've had a lot of rain recently. We had some rain this weekend, and at my house, it's raining right now. So if the water doesn't get soaked back up into the water cycle, you can look that up at the end of today's webinar if you don't remember exactly what that is, um, or it doesn't get absorbed by all of the plants that are in my yard, where does it go? What happens to it? Right? It has to go somewhere. So this is what we're going to discover today is where exactly does that go? So water, once it rains, eventually will end up in things like streams, lakes, ponds, rivers, and eventually the ocean. And a huge expanse of land where all of that happens, we might call a watershed or a drainage basin. You sometimes hear people use those two words in the same way, but for today's sake, we're going to call it a watershed. And here in Missouri, and in a lot of other states, we are in the Mississippi watershed. Right? And I have a map here. I'm going to hold it a little bit far away because I discovered testing this out that if I hold it too close, it interferes with my green screen. So this is a map of the continental United States. The dark green area, right? those are states that are not in the Mississippi watershed. What is in the light green area surrounded by that dark black line, that's the Mississippi watershed. And we can think of it as reaching from the Rocky Mountains to the west of St. Louis, all the way over to the Appalachian mountain chain to the east of St. Louis. So that is a huge amount of land. So with that, I've got my first brain teaser for you today. Connor's going to pull up a poll because I want to know how many states do you think contribute to the Mississippi watershed? If you need a reminder, remember we have 50 states in the United States. And I gave you some options. It is pre-lunchtime. Maybe we're just getting woken up here. So I wonder how many states do you think are in the Mississippi watershed? And if the poll hasn't popped up, 
Um, it's absolutely all right to just guess, right? Guess away. So I'll give you the options that I thought of. So you can choose from 15, 31, 45, or 22 states. So, hmm. How many states? Oh, all right, excellent. So it looks like most of you have picked 22 with 15 states coming in at a pretty close second. So here we are. Drum roll, please. The number of states that contribute to the Mississippi watershed is 31. Absolutely mind blowing when I found that out. So 31 states in the United States, either the whole state or part of the state, some of their water eventually ends up in the Mississippi River, as well as the Canadian provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan. Some of their water ends up in the Mississippi as well too. That's almost half of our country, it's crazy. <laughs> so that is a large amount of area. And that's also a lot of animals using those water sources. So in the chat box for me, while we're still interacting in there, um, go ahead and think about and share with me what kinds of animals do you think might use some of the rivers, the big rivers, the small rivers that lie within this Mississippi watershed region. So here's the map again, in case you need a refresher. So what kinds of animals? And I'm going to get just a little bit closer to my computer screen so that I can see what you're typing because where I am right now, it's a little bit too far away for me. All right, birds, turtles, salamanders, yeah, invertebrates, fox, deer, fish, alligators, bugs. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> I love it. So all of these animals that I am seeing absolutely flying by, um, yeah, a lot of them do end up using the water in some form or another that we get in our Mississippi watershed and all of those rivers and streams and tributaries, you might even hear some people say. So all of the, right, every animal needs water, right? Food, water, shelter, space. Those are the four main things that we always think of the basic needs of all animals. And water is a pretty important one. And clean water is an important thing too. So we're going to go and investigate a model that I have made um, to give us an idea of how all of this rainwater that has been falling around in my area, how it eventually gets to the Mississippi River. And we're gonna do some experimenting along the way too because scientists love experiments. So if you will give me just a moment, I'm going to share a different screen so that you can see my model. You may see your screen go dark for a moment. That's perfectly fine. That will happen until I get my other setup ready to go. Okay. So I'm going to share that. And this is where you're probably going to start seeing a dark screen. I'm going to move over to my model and just like that you get to see what I see. <laughs> so this is a model of a watershed that I made and I made it out of aquarium gravel so that's the kind of greeny blue gravel you see some rocks and then this is modeling clay mixed with some sand to kind of be a, uh, a substitute for soil, right? Any good scientist, when they are investigating things and trying things out, especially if what they're investigating is really, really big, might make a model and then do some tests on it. So those are some of the leftover colors that you see on my clay from when I was testing my model. But we are going to continue to test this model today. I have some little tributaries, some smaller streams carved out right along here. This area we're going to think of as our Mississippi River right here. So all of these little tributaries are flowing into the Mississippi. Um, I made a few little depressions, some little dents in my clay. Uh, maybe that's something like a pond or a lake, a place where water can gather. I've made some hills. The hills are a little hard to see, but here's a little hill right here. And a little hill right here. 
And then this funny looking area right here is a piece of wax paper. Now there are places where water cannot soak through on the ground. And when I say that, I'm thinking like concrete, asphalt, blacktop. So the things we use to make our dri driveways, roads, streets, sidewalks, right? Water can't really soak through that. It just kind of runs off. And I pulled some things from my kitchen too, um, so that we can see what, when humans, when we start to alter environments, because we like to do that and that's okay, uh, what could happen when it rains? And then what happens to all of these water sources? So let's get into the fun stuff where we start seeing some colors. I am going to imagine that in this part of our watershed example, uh, there's a neighborhood up there. And with it being springtime, I know one of my favorite activities right now is to get out into my yard and start to get my gardens ready. Uh, so maybe, you know, making sure I have all my flowers and where I want them. And this year I'm planting a vegetable garden. So the folks in that neighborhood, they're going to plant a vegetable garden too. And one of my favorite things to eat is salsa. And you can grow the ingredients for salsa pretty easy. You need some tomatoes and onions and maybe some jalapeno peppers, maybe less spicy peppers or more spicy peppers, depending on how hot you like your salsa, some cilantro, all of that good stuff. So this neighborhood, they're, they're having a salsa growing party. And they want all of their vegetables to grow really, really big. So they are just dumping on all kinds of fertilizer. If plants need water and nutrients to grow, and sometimes our soil may not have all of the nutrients it needs for the plants to grow as big as they are, so we use fertilizer. But these guys, they didn't read the instructions on their fertilizer, so they're just putting all of the fertilizer. So much fertilizer. They want nice, big, juicy tomatoes for their salsa. So much fertilizer. And what I am using is not real fertilizer. I am using some powder drink mix that I had in my kitchen. So it's safe to touch. Okay, so we also know that some people grow food for a living like farmers. And farmers, they sometimes put chemicals on their crops like fertilizers and maybe herbicides and pesticides too. You know, it's a pretty common thing around here once you get out of the city in St. Louis. There are a lot of farms. And they're pretty good about reading the instructions on these chemicals. So they use what I like to call the Goldilocks amount. Uh, they don't use too much, they don't use too little, they use just the right amount because they have a lot of land that they need to make sure they're taken care of. So I'm just gonna sprinkle a little bit of fertilizer where maybe our farm might be. I have some rogue fertilizer chunks here running into my stream. <laughs> that wouldn't happen normally when giants coming down putting fertilizer on fields. It'd be kind of funny to think about though. Okay, so there's our farmer. Um, and let's see here, right by our farmer's field, he has a little, a little channel, maybe that's a small creek. And some of the plants that used to live along that creek, maybe they've you know, gotten pulled out or something's eaten them, like maybe cows or deer and they're just not there to hold back the soil like they used to. So I have some hot cocoa mix that I'm going to use as soil along the bank of our little stream here. Right. When soil leaves places like that, we could call that erosion. Maybe you've heard that word in science before, erosion. So there's some soil that might get eroded. All right, now what about our surface, like our parking lot or road or sidewalk? I think today I'm going to pretend that it is a parking lot. And sometimes, um, I know because I'm not driving my car as much anymore, sometimes when cars sit around for a little bit, maybe we need to give them some extra love and attention uh, when we start driving them again. So there might have been a car on this parking lot that is leaking some oil. That's pretty important to cars. So I have some balsamic vinegar that I'm just going to drop on my parking lot from this leaky car. It's always a good idea to keep our cars in good working condition and stop those leaks 
if we can find them, sometimes we miss them. I know me personally, I'm more of an animal person than a car person, so there's a good chance I might miss a leaf in my car. <laughs> okay, and let's see here. And then I have some instant iced tea that we'll just use and sprinkle as just other kinds of things that might be on the ground. Nice can be anything we imagine. So there's the instant iced tea. All right, so this is what it looks like when it's dry. This stuff isn't really going anywhere. But let's find out what happens when it rains. I've got my handy dandy bottle of blue water so you can see it, and I am going to make it rain. And if you would like to go ahead and enter your observations into the chat, I would love to see them when I stop sharing the screen. Uh, I'm gonna take a look at them when you see my face again. All right, here we go, here comes the rain sound a little bit funny. My water bottle sounds funny. Ooh, I see some things starting to happen already. Oh, look at that. How interesting. Are you noticing that some of the things I placed on the model are running off faster than others? Are some moving slower than others? Or is some not moving at all? Mm. I think my red drink mix was cherry. It smells really good. <laughs> I'm going to make it rain just a little bit longer and we'll think about what we just saw. Wow, I'm noticing a lot of really interesting things happening. So in our neighborhood where they were growing their salsa ingredients, some of that seemed to run off kind of fast to me because there was too much. Uh, it looked like our farmer here, some of it's starting to move, but I see right here and here it might be moving a little bit slower so that it has time to get into the soil so that the plants can absorb it like they need to. And there's a little bit of our oil maybe left on our parking lot, but the rest of it, I'm not sure where it went. Probably went that way. <laughs> so eventually kind of all of that stuff ended up in our water. And you all mentioned some really great animals before we started looking at this that might need to use this water by either drinking in it, maybe they live in it. And there's one really important animal that I always think of when I'm thinking about how my actions in my yard could affect animals that live downstream. And that's an animal called the Ozark Hellbender. And I have a picture of one right here. <laughs> so this is an Ozark Hellbender. Uh, they are the largest kind of salamander, an amphibian like a frog or a toad, in the United States. And what's really special is that the Ozark Hell Hellbender only lives in the state of Missouri. It's the only place in the entire world where you find it. And they get to be about two feet long. So after this webinar, if you can find a ruler, measure out two feet, and that's how long they can get. It's pretty big. But these guys, they need a little bit of our help because some of these actions that, like what we saw in our model, um, have caused their population, their numbers to decline. Uh, through things like water pollution, since from the time they're an egg to the time they're an adult, they don't leave the water, uh, and something called sedimentation. So all of that loose soil that erodes from the banks of the rivers sometimes fills in the little spaces between the rocks at the bottom of the stream where they like to hang out. That's where they hide during the day. That's where their food, like crayfish, might hide. Crayfish are their favorite food. Uh, and that's also where a male will guard a clutch of eggs until they hatch into larvae and they're ready to develop and live on their own. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, take a look at your observations, and then we're going to think about some ways that we could help animals like the hellbender 
which by the way, the next time you're able to come to the St. Louis Zoo, check them out because they're one of our animals in a wild care institute that we're helping at the zoo and in the wild. They're pretty cute as you can see and very hard to find. But I want to think about what are ways that we can start to help these animals. Okay, so I'm going to end my share screen. I might be kind of close <laughs> by the time you see me again. Here we go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to take a look at your observations really quick. Oh, I see someone said they're obsessed with hellbenders. Me too. They're so cute. All right. All right. Oh, I see a good question. Can this flow ever be controlled? It can, and we can talk about some ways that it can. Um, yeah, cool. All right. So a lot of you guys saw some of the same observations that I did. That's really, really great. So what are some ways that we can help animals like the hellbender and animals that might use the river, like otters and frogs, other kinds of amphibians, deer, beaver? Hmm. Well, I know I don't live by a river. Um, I have a storm drain on my street where water from the street flows, but that's about as close as I get. So some simple things that we can do is, one thing's really easy, just pick up trash, right? Um, pick up, maybe if you're going on a walk around your neighborhood, you can take some tongs and a plastic bag and just pick up what you see along the way. It may not be your trash, but it is your neighborhood. And so it's all of our responsibility to help keep that clean. Um, me, because I live in a house with a yard, I'm choosing not to use any chemicals on my yard. So I don't use fertilizers or things like herbicides, weed killers, um, pesticides, bug killers, stuff like that. Um, but that's a choice I'm making. I have neighbors that aren't making the same choice. So I might encourage them to be like our farmer and read the instructions on those chemicals so that you're using the Goldilocks amount, the just right amount that is appropriate for your yard. Um, another thing you can do is when you're taking your pet for a walk is to make sure you pick up your pet's waste. That can be a problematic pollutant in some of our waterways. All animals poop, it's a fact of life. I know when I'm walking around my neighborhood or my backyard, I don't want to step in it. So I'm going to be a good neighbor and make sure all of my pet waste is cleaned up. So I have another poll for you all, and it's some options of things that you could do, maybe even starting today, to help keep our watersheds clean. And if you choose other, go ahead and write in the chat box what other kind of action you think you'd like to take to help keep our Mississippi watershed clean and healthy for all of the animals that live there. And if you're already doing some of these things, great. Just checking out to see what else is happening in the chat. I'll put filters on all the drains. That's a really good idea. That could be kind of an interesting concept. Yeah. <laughs> all right, and I did put planting native plants. Um, so depending on where you are in the Mississippi watershed, you could plant different plants than maybe like the ones I have in my yard. All right, great, so excellent. I love seeing all of your responses. That's really fantastic. Uh, so with the native plants, if you don't live in Missouri or in my region of Missouri around St. Louis, you can have a grown up help you with a quick Google search. You can search native plants, your state or native plants, your zip code. And there are a lot of sources out on the internet to help you determine what kinds of plants are best because those plants are going to provide habitat for animals and even animals that might take care of the bugs that you don't want hanging around your house. <laughs> okay, so with that, I'm gonna take some time to look at our Q&A to see if I can get some of your questions answered. And then at the very end of today's webinar, we will have an enjoyment poll for you all to take as well. So that's your last poll. Okay, so let's see here. What kinds of questions do we have? Ah, uh, yes. 
Ah, great question. So the first one is, will you share some details on how you created your large model in a PDF format? So I do have some uh, instructions for how you can make your own model, but it's not quite as complicated as mine. For your model, you'll just need stuff from around your house. So something like a large baking dish with some tall sides, or maybe a large water um, like a plastic tub, and then some cups, I've got a bowl, something to make it lumpy bumpy, kind of like I did on my model. And the last thing you'll need, let me grab it here, <laughs> is some aluminum foil. So you can place the foil on top of your model, mold it around your lumpy bumpy stuff. You can try to make a river channel or a tributary if you'd like, or you can just experiment and just see where your water goes. So there will be instructions on the zoo's resource page by the end of this webinar. So, okay, great question. So why is the fertilizer going fastest? So I'm guessing you might have seen uh, the part where I put towards the top where the fertilizer is, and it's going the fastest just because there is more of it. All right, good question. All right, why do the hellbenders never leave the water? Ooh, what a thoughtful question. So hellbenders, um, they've just for, decided that their entire life is best in water. So they're really adapted to living in water. So being amphibians, all amphibians start in some kind of water source. So they have their little jelly eggs um, that you can see. I think they're really cute. They're jelly eggs that need to stay in water so that, so that they don't dry out. And then tadpoles or the larva, when they hatch, the water is the best place for them to be. So if you've ever seen a tadpole, it kind of looks like a fish, but it's not quite a fish, but it has a tail. They may have gills and they eat a lot of things in the water. So hellbenders, if you remember that picture, they had a lot of wavy, loose skin on the side of their body. Um, it gives them one of their nicknames is also lasagna sides because it looks like a lasagna noodle. Don't eat a hellbender though, they don't taste good. Pretty sure they don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but all of those adaptations just help them live in the water and that's what they're adapted to and it's where they like to hang out the best. Okay, Kenzie wants to know, what is your favorite animal that uses the water? So my favorite animal that uses the water is called the Florida manatee. Here's some people call them floaty potatoes because they are very round and they're just beautiful, peaceful creatures. So if you've never seen one, look them up. I think they're pretty adorable. <laughs> Good question. Uh, what do I do at the St. Louis Zoo? Thanks, Josie. Uh, I am an educator, so I'm a teacher. So I, unlike your teachers maybe that teach in a classroom at school, I get to teach at the zoo. Only today I'm teaching from my home. <laughs> And where do hellbenders live? Hellbenders live in the Ozark region of the state of Missouri. So in those fast, cool moving streams in that part of our state. Good question. All right. So I think, unfortunately, I'm not going to have any more time to answer the rest of your questions. I'm so sorry. Um, thank you all so much for joining me today. I had a lot of fun sharing some of these things with you. I have Hope you had a lot of fun learning and don't forget to take this enjoyment poll at the very end because like I said we really enjoy being able to bring the zoo to you while you are at home and some of us are also at home. I hope you have a safe and wonderful rest of your day and we'll see you soon.